Let's uh, turn to Matthew chapter 2. I was going to do Matthew chapter 2 anyway. And you know what? Since it is about the star, um, I will really quick. I've got a, I've got a computer program on my, on my computer here where I, can, where I can show you what may have been going on. So Matthew chapter 2. Let's pray before we start and, and uh, we'll get into it. Jesus, uh, thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you for the fact that you're um, the God who came down. Uh, Lord, we thank you that you're, uh, like Courtney was saying earlier, you're Emmanuel, you're God with us. And um, Lord, as we celebrate the Christmas uh, season, uh, we just pray that our focus would be set on you, um, that we wouldn't be distracted by all the stuff that, that can get in the way of who you are and what you want to do in our lives and in the lives of the people who are around us, and Lord, we just want to be people who worship you. And so um, we just give you the study this evening and pray that you'd be speaking to our hearts, showing us the things uh, that um, you want us to see, and that you do this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, Matthew chapter 2. Um, I thought we would do this because it's just good for Christmas. Verse 1, it says, Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, the old wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we've seen his star in the east and have come to worship him. And when Herod the king heard this, he was troubled in all Jerusalem with him. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. So they said to him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet, But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not the least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod, when he had secretly called the wise men, determined from them what time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, go and search carefully for the young child. And when you have found him, bring back word to me that I may come and worship him also, um, which was obviously a lie. And when they heard the king, they departed and behold, the star which they had seen in the east went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceedingly great joy. And when they had come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary, his mother, and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented gifts to him, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Then being divinely warned in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed for their own country another way. And uh, let's stop right there. Let me um, get, this, get this program up. It's, this is actually a pretty cool thing if you've never seen it. And if you had, have seen it, um, it's still a pretty cool thing. Come on up, buddy. Where are you at? Really? Why is it not going? Is it up? Oh, it is up. It's it's because I've got it. Um, let me let me let me change something here. I got to change the setting because I'm not going to be able to see it if I don't if I don't do this. Um, There we go. And what this is, is a, it's a computer program. And um, basically, it's, it's an astronomy program. Um, I uh, like astronomy. And so I have a telescope. And I mess around with it. I haven't messed around it, with it um, lately. Um, it's, it's been a while just because I've been busy. Um, but... Um, this is a cool program because what you can do is you can show what the sky looks like at um, certain times of the year or certain times of the year. And what I'm doing is go going back to 3 BC, basically. And we're going to do this midnight. And then I'm going to uh, uh, give the location. And let's do a location of... Um, right around the area of Babylon, which is right around the area of Baghdad in Iraq. Okay, so this is what the sky looks like 
um, on uh, January 21st, 3 BC. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to, um, let, me, let me do this real quick because I need to show you some stuff. Okay. Can you see this pretty well? Can you see this? Go ahead and turn the, turn the lights down. You can turn this light down too. I don't need this. Like these. I don't need these, dude. Okay. Does that make it better? Okay. This right here is a constellation Leo. It's a lion. This is Virgo. This is Cancer. This is Gemini. This right here is Jupiter. This is Regulus. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to lock in on Regulus here. And I'm going to show you some stuff that was going on in the couple of years, uh, actually in the year before Jesus was born. Um, okay, so what I've done here is I've locked my program on the star Regulus um, in the constellation Leo. Now, here's, here's the deal with this. When you go through and you look at this passage, um, what's happening with the with the wise men is they're obviously following a star. There's something that's taken place in the heavens that they're seeing. And when I was a kid, uh, people would talk about what the star was and, and uh, many times people would say, well, maybe it was a comet, uh, that kind of thing. Probably not uh, because comets back in those days were something that were uh, uh, kind of, um, what, what am I gonna use? I wanna say portents, but that's, <laughs> that's too huge a word, uh, signs. They were signs of doom is what comets were. And so um, it probably wasn't a comet. Um, some people have thought that maybe it was uh, something like a supernova. When you have a star explode outside of our solar system, you can have it flare up and become bright for a period of time. And that period of time can last literally for months um, uh, while it's doing that. So that's a possibility. But one of the things that you see in this passage is the only ones who are paying attention to any of the stars are the Magi. The Magi were um, guys uh, who are from the area of Babylon. Uh, these are the same guys that Daniel was involved with um, uh, in the book of Daniel when he was uh, part of the wise men, uh, when he got put uh, in that group of guys by Nebuchadnezzar. Um, they were stargazers, they were astrologers, uh, they were wise men, they were also kingmakers. And um, there is something going on with these guys. And when I say astrologers, it's something less than the astrology that we do today. The astrology that we do today, you, you look up in the newspaper and you find your sign and they're supposed to tell you the future based on you know, the influences of gravity from the planets that were around when you were born and that kind of thing. And it wasn't so much that way back then. Um, it was a little bit more like astronomy uh, is today. Um, not quite like astronomy. It wasn't just a science, but um, because they, they did see signs in the heavens. These guys were basically guys who um, on a certain level were involved in the occult. Uh, again, because of this whole thing with uh, the worship of the stars, and they did do that. They did worship the stars. They did worship the heavens, and they thought there was, there was some power that came from it. Um, one of the, one of the cool things is that the, they, um, understand that something is happening, um, in the heavens that points to the coming of the Messiah. And there's a reason that they would think that, um, in the book of Numbers, actually, why don't you, why don't you turn there, turn there with me real quick. Book of Numbers, um, let's see, I think it's chapter 22. I'm doing this off the, off the top of my head. Um, nope, it's chapter 24. And this is the, this is the oracle of Balaam. And um, what's happened is a guy named Balak, who is the king of Edom, wants Balaam to curse Israel. And um, he uh, buys Balaam, basically. Balaam's like a prophet for hire. He comes down to curse Israel. God tells Balaam, he was a guy who knew the Lord. Um, God tells him, I don't want you to do anything except for what I tell you. And so three different times, Balak gets Balaam up on top of a hill to curse Israel, who's down in the valley. And he keeps switching hills because every time that Balaam starts uh, his prophecy over Israel, he begins blessing them. And this is one of the prophecies. It's in uh, chapter 24. 
in verse 17. Actually, let's start um, up in verse 15. It says, the utterance of Balaam, the son of Baor, and the utterance of the man whose eyes are opened, the utterance of him who hears the words of God and has the knowledge of the Most High, who sees the vision of the Almighty, who falls down with his wise eye uh, or his eyes wide open. I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star shall come out of Jacob. A scepter shall rise out of Israel and batter the brow of Moab and destroy all the sons of tumult. And Edom shall be a possession. Seir also his enemy shall be a possession while Israel does valiantly. Out of Jacob, one shall have dominion and destroy the remains of the city. And so he goes on there. But there's this whole um, prophecy about a star in connection with the one who's going to come out of Israel. And the only way that the Magi could know about anything that has to do with a star and the coming of the Messiah is from Daniel. And Daniel, um, you know from the book of Daniel, was made the head of these guys. And so um, we're talking about now about 500 years after Daniel has died, and these guys are still looking for the coming of the Jewish Messiah. And so Daniel had this major impact on these people. He'd witnessed to them. And so there's, there's still a, uh, an impact that uh, took place with these guys. And so um, astronomers have gone through and tried to figure out what the star was. And, you know, like I said, there, there are a couple of options there. One of the problems has been with figuring out what, what exactly was going on is that the dating of the birth of Christ um, has been off. And it all centers around the death of Herod. You know that at the end of this story, it talks about um, from 13 to 15, it, it talks about in Matthew's, uh, Matthew chapter 2, it talks about um, Joseph and Mary uh, taking Jesus down into Egypt. And then Herod kills the children, uh, the little boys two years old, old and under in Bethlehem. And then Jesus returns after Herod dies. And so the whole issue of the birth of Jesus and when these things take place is connected with the death of Herod. And there are, there are two things that you have uh, in history that are connected with the death of Herod. One is a war. It's called the War of Varus. It was just, a, just basically a, the putting down of a, of a rebellion uh, by the Roman Empire in the area of what we would call Syria now. And the other event uh, were events that led up to Herod's death, one of which was a solar eclipse. And a solar eclipse is when the, the, the earth gets in front of the moon, and so you have a red moon. That's a solar eclipse. Or excuse me, a, a lunar eclipse. Did I say solar? Yeah, sorry, I meant a lunar eclipse. That's a lunar eclipse. And so there were these events that took place, uh, according to Josephus, that started with the death of a couple of priests, or actually a couple of rabbis, because they took down a Roman eagle off the walls of the temple of uh, the temple in Jerusalem. The Romans had come in, it was uh, coming up to Passover season, and they just liked to tweak the Jews, and so they took a Roman eagle, stuck it on the wall, which was their standard, and the, the Jews considered that to be an idol. And so what the Romans have done is taken an idol and stuck it on the walls of the temple. And so the Jews were outraged, and so these guys go in and tear it down, and when they tear it down, um, Herod uh, figures out who did the whole thing, and to placate the Romans, he has these guys put to death. And on the day that they were put to death, there was a lunar eclipse. Okay? And then you, again, have this whole thing with the War of Varus. And um, because of the War of Varus, what, what scholars have done is they push the date of Jesus' birth back to before 4 BC. Because that's when they thought this war took place. There's a couple of other dates that... That took place with that. And there was a, a lunar eclipse during that time, but the lunar eclipse was only partial. And so I don't know if you've ever gone out and looked at a partial lunar eclipse. Um, it is kind of cool, but it's nothing like a full-blown lunar eclipse. There was a lunar eclipse in um, 1 BC, and it was a, fully, uh, a full lunar eclipse that could be seen from Jerusalem. The other thing that you have in connection with those two things, is you have this period of time where there's a lunar eclipse and then you, you come up to the Passover and there's all this stuff that Herod did um, during that period of time before he died. And so he died before the Passover that year. 
And so the stuff that we're talking about um, either took place about 27 days before Herod, di Herod died, or they took place um, a couple of months before Herod died, depending on what year you're talking about. If you're talking about 45, uh, 4 BC, then you're talking about 27 days. If you're talking 1 BC, you're talking um, over uh, almost two months uh, period of time. And there's all this stuff that had to take place. So Herod moved a couple of times from Jerusalem down to Jericho. Uh, Herod sent uh, messages to Rome. Uh, a guy came from Rome. Um, in, into Israel, and obviously he's not hopping a flight. He's getting on a boat and sailing. And so the 4 BC date will not work, according to the history, which, which puts it at 1, 1 BC. And if you put this date at 1 BC, you have plenty of time for all these events that took place with Herod uh, to take place, and uh, everything would be cool, okay? And so if that's the case, then what? Then, then this this event right here in Matthew chapter two uh, probably took place late two B.C. and early one B.C. somewhere in there. Okay. And so now what we're going to do is just take a couple of years before that, and I'm going to show you what's going on. Okay. So Leo is who's the king of who's the king of the forest? Yeah, the lion. You watch the Wizard of Oz, right? Um, so the lion is the, is the king of the jungle, right? And Leo is the kingly um, constellation. Th this is Leo right here, and this is Virgo down here. Virgo represents a virgin, right? And so, so you have the kingly uh, constellation, and this is Regulus. And Regulus is the kingly star. Um, you know, Rex. Regulus is a, is a term that just means uh, kingly or, or king. And then you have this up here, which is Jupiter. And this is, the, this is some of the stuff that we're going to be looking at. So Jupiter is going to have a couple of passes with Regulus, and Jupiter is the king planet. So when we think of the king of the Roman gods, it, the king of the Roman gods is Jupiter. And in Greek, he's called Zeus. And so it's the king planet, the king constellation, the king's star. Also, Jesus is called the lion of the tribe of Judah, right? And so the lion is connected with the tribe of Judah in Israel. And I don't know if you knew this, but each one of the tribes, there are 12 constellations in the zodiac. And each one of the tribes of Israel was connected with one of those constellations. And so, um, you know, you, you have that whole thing. That's another whole Bible study. But in any case, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you um, what was taking place during this time, and I can't, I can never remember um, how I do this. Uh, let's, let's do update, um, uh, we'll do 0.5 seconds and see if that's fast enough. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you a day every half a second, and I don't, I don't know if that's fast enough, but we'll see. Yeah, it's not fast enough. Okay, let me, let me change this. Every quarter second. Okay, so now what you're going to watch is Regulus right here, and you're going to watch Jupiter right here. Can you guys see those? Can you see them? Okay, here we go. That's the moon going across. And what you're going to see is Jupiter start creeping towards Regulus here. I'll keep it up where you can see it. That's the sun, so you wouldn't be see, seeing Jupiter at that point until um, sunrise, basically. And let's go a little slower. Here we go. Now watch this. Now you have the king planet on the king star in the king constellation. And it's covering it. Now let me, let me show you this. 
This is, this is how close this, this is called a conjunction. And this is how close this is. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to zero in here. That is what Jupiter looks like from a telescope. You can see the moons. And that's what these are. I'll, I'll, I'll get it a little closer to you. So those are the moons of Jupiter. And this is the, this is the first um, conjunction that these guys would have seen. And so literally, um, this is about what it looks like. Let me, let me see. Um, right about there. That's what it looks like when you would go outside and you would just look up at the sky with the naked eye. Okay? Um, but obviously, when you get in a telescope, it gets cooler as, as we go on. When you look in a telescope, it doesn't look like it's that close. So basically, right in there or right in here is what it would look like. And so Jupiter is cover, covering Regulus, the king, the king planet, over the king star in the king constellation. And this is this has taken place um, in the month of September um, in 3 BC. And this is when the this is when the um, conjunction starts. It starts on September 11th of 3 BC. Okay, so that's the that's the first thing that they would see, and then it goes on, and watch what watch what happens again. So now Jupiter is going to going to keep going, and it begins moving away. And now it stops right here. Okay, see that it stops. And then what's gonna happen is it's gonna start coming back. And this is called ret retrograde motion. Um, and it's kind, of a, a, it's kind of a hard concept to explain to you. Um, but watch this. Here it comes and boom, another conjunction with the king star, king planet, or uh, yeah, the king planet, the king star in the king constellation. And this is 219 of 2 BC. So this is in February of 2 BC now. And then it keeps, then it keeps going on. Um, the reason that you have retrograde motion with, uh, with a planet uh, is because of the, the way that um, the earth orbits the sun, okay? And so, um, I, don't, I don't know how to explain this to you expect, except for sitting here and just doing things with my hands. Um, let's, let's do it this way. Okay. This is a star. This is Jupiter. And I'm the Earth. Okay. And my head is the sun. Right here? Okay. Okay. And so what's happening is as the Earth is going around the sun, it's going around like this, right? And Jupiter is doing exactly the same thing. It's going like this. But the stars in the background, they're not moving in relation to the background. The stars always stay in the background. Okay? And so when, when you're looking at Jupiter from the Earth, uh, let's, let's say... Jupiter's back behind the, or the Earth is back behind the sun like this, and we're looking at Jupiter, say it's sitting right here. So there's a star in the background, here's Jupiter, and the Earth is sitting right here. Jupiter is actually, as it's moving, it's going this direction. And so it's going this direction, and the Earth is, the Earth is coming around, and so when I look at it from this point of view, Jupiter is to the left of that star, right? And then as, and, and Jupiter's going to be moving just a little bit because it moves slower than the Earth. But then the Earth comes out here, and now, I'm sitting here looking at it, it's a little bit further away from the star. But then as the Earth comes around this way, what it looks like is that Jupiter is moving towards the star. It's not actually, it's just that the Earth is moving. And so now I've got a line of sight right here, and when I get to right here, it's sitting on top of that star. And then as the Earth comes back around here, the Jupiter is still going to be moving a little bit, but now it's on the left, or it, it's on it's on my right side of that star, and that's retrograde grade motion. From from what I just showed you, basically what what's happened is um, uh, it looks like Jupiter has gone like this, 
then gone back like this to the other side of the star, and then as I go back around, it's going to look like it gets further away from the star, and that's retrograde motion. Um, it's not actually that Jupiter's moving like that, it's just that, that that's, the, that's what we see um, when we're looking at it from the Earth. And so retrograde motion brings Jupiter right back over Regulus, and let's keep going. So we are in February of 2 BC, and then it goes around. It comes right back, and it's going to go over it again. And so there we have, in May of uh, 2 BC, another conjunction with uh, with uh, uh, Regulus, Jupiter and Regulus. And so basically what these guys would have seen is uh, the first conjunction would have been a big fat deal to them, and then they would have seen the second conjunction, and they probably took off right about this time and started coming to um, Israel. So they've seen one conjunction in 3 BC. They, need, they see retrograde motion going back towards Regulus again and uh, at the early part of 2 BC. Then it goes back towards Regulus again. And by this time, these guys are probably packing it up and going to Israel. Okay. And here we go again. And now you have another situation where now you have, this is, a, this is another conjunction. Um, when it gets this close, and again, um, <coughs> this is, this is um, eyeballing it. When it gets this close, you have Venus and Jupiter and Regulus um, all in Leo. And now Venus, which is what's called the mother planet, has had a conjunction with Regulus too. So now Jupiter has had three conjunctions. Venus has had one conjunction. And then we're going to move on here. And then there's, did you see that? So not only, wait, let me uh, stop, let's go back. Not only is there a conjunction with um, uh, Regulus, there is a conjunction with Jupiter. And so now you have Jupiter and Venus having a conjunction all, all in the kingly constellation um, in close proximity to the, uh, the kingly star. And watch this. This is how close this, cons this, this uh, um, oops, I need to do this. Um, where's my lock? I'm going to lock it on Jupiter now. This is how close this touching of the planets comes. Oops. Well, I gotta do it by hours now. And so literally, if you were looking through a telescope, you, you would have Venus touching Jupiter. And so that's, that, that's a cool conjunction. Um, and I know that's, that's all geeky on my part. Sorry. But it's cool. Okay. Okay, so here we go. And now we'll follow Jupiter. Uh, it's, a, it's the horizon, and I'm, I'm just leaving it. You know, I can, I can get it to where it's above the horizon. You have a conjunction with uh, Mars and Jupiter. Yeah. And now what we're doing is we're, we're coming towards um, Christmas time, actually, of 2 B.C., and in this passage, it talks about the fact that they go out and the star stops. And this is what I was going to show you here. Oh, I went too far. Okay, let me, let me get it back 
um, where you can see it good. Okay. Now, I'm going to zero in here. And what you're going to need to do is you're going to need to, need to watch the background stars. And watch this. So I'm going to, I'm going to go by days. Now watch this. Okay, so we're coming up. It's the 22nd, 23rd, 24th, 25th. See the background stars? Now watch this. 26th. 27th, 28th, 29th. And what happens is um, literally when you, when you sit here and you zoom in on this, it's on December 25th of 2 BC that literally Jupiter stops in Virgo. Um, and and, the, star, and the, the planet literally stops. And so a lot of people think, uh, uh, actually astronomers think that this is the star and this may be a reference to the fact um, that the star which they had seen in the east um, went before them, and then it stood over where the young child was. Um, it, gets to, it gets a little bit more spooky than that, uh, because literally a little bit later, um, it says, uh, it talks about the fact that it, um, was, it was over the house uh, where the young child was. But in any case, that is a big fat deal to people who are astrologers back at the time that this was going on. And there's a really good chance that that's what the Christmas star was all about. So um, when, when you're looking at the date of Jesus's birth, we celebrate Jesus's birth on uh, December 25th. And part of the reason that we celebrate it on December 25th may not have to do with the fact that he was necessarily born on that day. It may literally have to do with the fact that that's when the, when the shepherds came and visited, or excuse me, the wise men came and visited him. This story may have to do with December 25th. And, you know, I'm a guy who doesn't have a problem with December 25th in the first place uh, because a, a lot of the objections that uh, people make to that um, um, aren't really actually um, valid objections. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. So isn't that cool? Okay. And so basically what happens is when you're, when you're looking at what was going on in the skies at the time, Jupiter is doing all this cool stuff. It's coming up and hitting Regulus and li literally circling around Regulus and then going to Virgo and it's stopping in Virgo and then going right back. And uh, again, you have this whole retrograde motion thing that's taking place. And that may be what the wise men were looking at. With that, um, I wanted to talk about a couple of other things that, that go on uh, during Christmas and uh, some of the some of the stuff that that we deal with, and um, I just wanted to give you a little bit of information. First thing is, um, you, you know, you guys watch Scrooge? Have you guys read the A Christmas Carol? So Scrooge says, you know, Scrooge, you know what you know what the the uh, famous phrase um, Scrooge uses of Christmas is? Yeah, bah humbug. This is um, actually let me. I I didn't put the slideshow back up. Let me let me start this whole thing. Is it up? Okay. Bah, said Scrooge, humbug. And a humbug is a person or object that behaves in a deceptive or dishonest way, often as a hoax or in jest. That's what a humbug is. So somebody, somebody, what's that? A humbug is a person or object that behaves in a deceptive or dishonest way, often as a hoax or in jest. And so basically what Scrooge is calling Christmas is a hoax, and he's kind of like a lot of people nowadays. Um, one of my favorite guys to pick on is Bill Maher. Bill, Bill Maher is a guy that picks on Christians left and right, always, always um, tries to trash believers. Um, when I, uh, I've seen a, his show a couple of times. I don't watch it now that it's, on, that it's on HBO because I don't watch HBO, but um, he would have like four or five guests on the show and he'd have one Christian and everybody would just pick on the Christian and he'd always bring up all kinds of nonsense. He wrote or, or he starred in a movie that he put together that was, that, um, he titled Religulous and it was literally a, a, uh, movie picking on Christians and what Christians believed. And there's this one scene where Bill Maher comes up to a Christian guy 
Um, it's during the Christmas season, and he starts picking on him about Christmas stuff. And you may have heard some of this stuff. Um, this is a quote from, from that movie. Um, uh, Bill Maher says, The Jesus story was an original, written in 1280 B.C. The Book of the Dead describes a god Horus. Horus is the son of, of the god Osiris, born to a virgin mother. He was baptized in, river, in a river by Anup the baptizer, who was later beheaded. Like Jesus, Horus was tempted while alone in the desert, healed the sick, the blind, cast out demons, and walked on water. He raised Asar from the dead. Asar translates to Lazarus. Oh yeah, he also had 12 disciples. Yes, Horus was crucified first, and after three days, two women announced Horus, the savior of humanity, had been resurrected. And so what they're saying is that, that, that this Egyptian god was um, actually somebody that um, people plagiarized from to get the Jesus story. Um, he also talks about the fact that there were three wise men and that Horus was born on December 25th, okay? How many wise men were there? Yeah, we have no idea. There were three gifts. We have no idea how many wise men were. And what day do we know that Jesus was born on? Yeah, we don't know. You know, December 25th isn't in the Bible. And so anytime that you have somebody that comes up and says that the Jesus story is a hoax because this God or that guy or this thing uh, was done on December 25th and there were three wise men who came to see him and, and all that kind of stuff. As soon as they th say three wise men and they say December 25th, you know that the guy doesn't know what they're talking about. They have no clue what they're, what, what they're talking about and it doesn't have anything to do with um, obviously the Jesus of the Bible. Um, 1280 BC, um, you know, uh, I'm just gonna go through and, and do some of these quotes. He said that the Book of the Dead was written in 1280 B.C., and he said that the Book of Dead describes a god Horus. No, it doesn't. Some of the books of the dead, there's not just one, there's a bunch, mention Horus, but the mythology actually comes from other, other um, uh, sources. Um, he said that Horus is the son of the god Osiris born to a virgin mother. No, he wasn't. Isis wasn't a virgin. This is, this is how Horus was born. Um, Horus had a brother named Set. Um, Set was the god of the desert. Set didn't like Horus, or ex yeah, excuse me, Osiris had a brother named, named Set, and Set was a god of the desert. Um, Set didn't like Osiris, and so Osiris killed him. And after he killed him, he chopped him up into 14 pieces. And he took those 14 pieces and he scattered them all over Egypt. And the story goes that um, uh, uh, Isis, who was the wife of Osiris, went and put together all the pieces, literally taped them, taped them together, except for one part that she needed really badly. And um, she did that so that she could get pregnant. The one part that she needed really badly, she couldn't find because it got thrown into the Nile River and got eaten by a catfish. No joke, it got eaten by a catfish in, in, the, in the thing. And so she made one out of gold. And then she got pregnant by this thing, and uh, that's how um, uh, Horus was supposed to have been born. That doesn't have anything to do with a virgin birth, right? Okay, wouldn't you say that? Um, he was baptized in a river by Anup, the baptizer who was later beheaded. There is no such person as Anup in Egyptian mythology. And so it's just made up. Um, like Jesus, Horus was tempted while alone in the desert. Um, Uncle Set was the god of the desert, and he was Horus's rival. That's not the same as being tempted in the desert. That whole thing didn't happen. There's no, there's no story about Horus being tempted in the desert. And then um, uh, he says that he uh, healed the sick, the blind, cast out demons, and walked on water. And the answer to that is nope, nope, nope. Horus was poisoned by Set when he was a kid. And Isis asked Thoth to heal him. Uh, Thoth is the dog-headed god. Um, asked him to heal him, and then Thoth's spell was used for prayer over sick Egyptians after that point. And so there was no walking on water, there was no casting out of demons. Um, he said that Asar translates to Lazarus, nonsense. Asar is Osiris, and that's Horus's dad. Horus did not raise him from the dead, and so he's got that one wrong. And then he said, oh yeah, he had 12 disciples, and the answer to that is nope, not anywhere in Egyptian mythology did Horus have 12 disciples. Um, then he says, yes, Horus was crucified first. And after three days, two women announced Horus, the savior of humanity, had been resurrected. Um, the problem with that is crucifixion wasn't invented until 500 BC. 
the, the Egyptian Book of the Dead that he said that he got all this information from was written, written in 1280 BC is uh, what he said, and so you just do the math. That's 780 years off. It's hard to get crucified 780 years before crucifixion, if crucifixion actually exists. And so, again, that's nonsense. And actually, the Horus mythologies go all the way back to 2400 BC. And so now you're talking about um, 1900 years before cru crucifixion um, ever um, happened. And so, you know, you have that whole thing. Then... Um, he talks about resurrection being poisoned as a child and then healed by the dog head God is not the same story as Jesus's crucifixion and resurrection. Okay. And so you, uh, again, you have that. Um, they said that he was born December 25th. Who cares? Actually, that's not in Egyptian mythology visited by three wise men. That is not in, in, in Egyptian mythology and it's not in the Bible either. So, um, you have that whole thing. I have a little thing that I wanted to show you, and this is the reason that I put all that in there, just so that I could show you this. This is one of my favorite things. I know it's geeky. Deal with it. Well, thanks to all of you for coming out to our service this morning, and I pray that the rest of this Christmas day is wonderful for each and every one of you. Not so fast, preacher man. Behold, it is I, Horus, Egyptian god of the sun, and while you all believe that you've been celebrating the birth of your lord Jesus, you've really been celebrating the birth of me. For you see, thousands of years before your Jesus came around, I, Horus, was born on December 25th. I, Horus, was born of a virgin. I, Horus, was baptized by a man called Arnop the Baptizer, was crucified and was resurrected three days later. So you see, your Jesus is nothing more than plagiarized poppycock, and I, Horus, have come to feast upon the sorrow of you foolish Christians. Yeah, none of the stuff you just said is true. Yes, it is. No, there's no reference in Egyptian mythology to Horus being crucified or resurrected three days later. There's no documentation anywhere for the existence of a figure named Anup the Baptizer. Horus' his mother was not a virgin woman, but the goddess Isis. And there is no specific date anywhere tied to the birth of Horus. I'm pretty sure there is. Actually, no. All of these claims and many others indicating that early Christians yoinked the mythology of Horus and stuck it on top of Jesus were all completely made up by Gerald Massey, a 19th century cuckoo banana bird self-taught Egyptologist who never provided the slightest shred of evidence for any of these claims and who was laughed out of the room by every serious Egyptologist on the planet. So thank you very much for your attempt to ruin our celebration of Christ's birth, but I'm afraid we're all still having a very Merry Christmas. Miss Horus. Horus? Did I say my name was Horus? No, no, no. What I meant to say was, Behold, it is I, Mithras, Roman cultic god of the something something, and why you all believe that you've been celebrating the birth of Jesus, you've really been celebrating the birth of me. For you see, I, Mithras, was born of a virgin. I, Mithras, had twelve disciples, and I, Mithras, gave those disciples a meal consisting of my body and my blood. Sound familiar, Christian dummies? Actually, Mithras was born from a rock, not of a virgin. He had two companions, not twelve disciples, and the Mithraic meal was one he shared with the sun god where they feasted not on his own flesh, but on the flesh of a bull. But even if those claims were true, Christians were already confessing the virgin birth, recognizing the twelve apostles, and celebrating the Lord's Supper before they ever encountered any Mithraic cults. So I'm afraid that you've taken neither the holly nor the jolly out of our Christmas, Mithras. Oh, you must have misheard me. I I'm not Mithras. I'm, uh, Quetzalcoatl, Aztec god of the wind. And while you all think that you've been... No Christian on the face of the planet ever heard of Quetzalcoatl until the 16th century. Well, then I'm... Baldur, Norse god of the... There were 193 popes before Baldur's mythology was actually written down. Then I'm Horus, Egyptian god of the sun. You already did that one. All right, fine. I didn't want to completely humiliate you, but you've left me no choice. I shall now unveil myself to be the ancient deity whose mythology was inarguably stolen by early Christians. Behold, I am... The ancient Mesopotamian god of judgment. 6,000 years before your Jesus spoke of returning to condemn the lost and resurrect the faithful, my followers proclaimed that I would return to do 
destroy my enemies and raise the dead. So silence your joyful voices, Christians. Your lord is nothing but a cheap carbon copy of me, the destructor who goes by many names. I am Volguus in Troja. I am lord of the Sibulia. I am Gozer the Gozerian. Gozer the Gozerian is from Ghostbusters. Dang it, why do so many people still know that movie? Sing with joy a song together. I don't understand. If all the things that Gerald Massey said about me were complete fabrications, with no textual evidence whatsoever, why do atheists like Bill Maher reference these claims as if they were true? Well, Horace, I suppose it is strange that people who insist that they won't believe anything without verifiable evidence are more than willing to believe anything without verifiable evidence as long as that thing can be used to mock the gospel. But we shouldn't be surprised when people reject proof of Christ's resurrection in favor of demonstrable lies that let them remain in unbelief. After all, Jesus did say, if they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced if someone should rise from the dead. I said that before Jesus did. Oh, you absolutely did not! <laughs> Isn't that awesome? <laughs> that stuff's been going around for a few years. There's a movie called Zeitgeist, and uh, there, you know, if you get on the internet, you guys, you'll you'll see this stuff all over the place. And um, when I first uh, saw that stuff, um, what I did was I just went to uh, actual websites where I could look up the actual mythology. And uh, fortunately, some people have put this stuff together so that you don't have to do that on your own. Uh, but when I looked it up, that's, that's all the stuff that I found. It's just, it's, it's a bunch of nonsense. Um, it's not true at all. Another, th another thing that comes up, uh, again, is the, the whole issue of uh, Christmas being a pagan cel celebration. Have you guys heard that? So Christmas is a, uh, it was originally Saturnalia. And this is another, you got this turned up, right, Matt? Um, this, is a, this is another show where they talk about this. This is the Big Bang Theory, um, if, if you don't know what this is. This guy right here is Sheldon. These guys are all really smart. They're a bunch of geeks. And um, Sheldon is the biggest geek of all, and he doesn't like Christmas. And so this is how this goes. Hey, Sheldon, are you and Leonard putting up a Christmas tree? No, because we don't celebrate the ancient pagan festival of Saturnalia. <laughs> Saturnalia? Gather round, kids. It's time for Sheldon's beloved Christmas special. <laughs> in the pre-Christian era, as the winter solstice approached and the plants died, pagans brought evergreen boughs into their homes as an act of sympathetic magic intended to guard the life essences of the plants until spring. Uh, this custom was later appropriated by Northern Europeans, and eventually it becomes the so-called Christmas tree. <laughs> And that, Charlie Brown, is what boredom is all about. <laughs> well, here's, uh, that, that's, the reason I um, gave you that clip is because that's a pretty common uh, thing that goes around at Christmas time. They always uh, attribute Christmas to Saturnalia, and basically, they're wrong, once again. Um, that's on my next slide, Sheldon got it wrong. Um, Saturnalia was celebrated on the 17th of December. It was never celebrated on the 25th of December. When it became a week-long festival, it was celebrated from the 17th to the 23rd. It was never celebrated on the 25th. And so Christmas cannot be Saturnalia. Uh, the whole thing with greenery, um, you know, uh, people do greenery all the time, um, and it was something that was common um, in pagan cultures, uh, I, actually because you have women. And, and, and they want their house to look nice. That's why I, I have greenery in my house right now because I have a wife. Before I had a wife, no greenery. You know, now that I have a wife, there is greenery. <laughs> you know? And so that's, that's all that that is. And whatever the pagans did with it, you know, they didn't do it on September or uh, December 25th anyway. Um, here's, here's another thing. Um, this whole thing with December 25th, where, would, where did we get the date? And there is another um, celebration called the Celebration of Saul Invictus that the Romans used to do. It, was, uh, it didn't actually start until the mid-fourth century. Um, after, actually, it started after Christianity became the um, religion of Rome. That's when the Celebration of Saul Invictus started. 
And they did celebrate Sol Invictus on the 25th of December, okay? Um, generally speaking, and you know, the, the whole thing with uh, Christmas being celebrated uh, at the winter solstice, the winter solstice is, uh, actually, we just had it. What, what, what's the date today, the 22nd? Uh, 21st? So it was like yesterday. It's yesterday, today is, uh, tonight's the longest uh, night of the year. So this is the 21st, and it's always been like this. So the winter solstice was never on, the, on December 25th. It doesn't work that way. And uh, that, again, was why you had uh, Saturnalia celebrated during that period of time. And so December 25th was never connected with that. The reason that um, December 25th became the birthday of Jesus is because of this whole thing uh, with the death of Christ. Um, the, the early Christians, uh, there, was this, there was this kind of a tradition um, that was going around at the time, that you would die on the same day that you were conceived. Okay? And so uh, the Western Roman Empire believed that Jesus died on March 25th. The Eastern Roman Empire believed that Jesus died on April 6th. Okay? And so if he dies on either one of those days, then he would be conceived on either one of those days. And if you were... Con if you <laughs> are conceived on March 25th. March 25th plus nine months is December 25th. And that's where the date for Jesus' birth came from. And in the Eastern Church, you know that they celebrate Christmas. They don't celebrate it on the 25th. They celebrate it on the 6th of January. And that's because of the April 6th date. And so it doesn't have anything to do with paganism. It has to do with uh, the dates that the early church um, came up with. Um, the Annunciation um, was dated on March 25th, and that's, that's the Annunciation is when um, Gabriel spoke to Mary. It was dated on Mar March 25th by Tertullian, and that, that guy lived before 200 AD. Um, specifically, uh, the birth of Jesus was taught as being on December 25th by Theophilus of Antioch, Hippolytus, and Julius Africanus. Do you see those dates there? 181, 204, 240. And so in the second century, that's 181. In the second century, uh, Theophilus was teaching that Jesus was born on December 25th. This is what he said. We ought to celebrate the birthday of our Lord on what day soever the 25th of December shall happen. And that's before 181 um, AD. And so you have the December 25th date long before you have any celebration of Sol Invictus and any celebration of Mithras or anything else. Uh, it was, it was, it's, a, it's a really ancient tradition, but most likely that's where it came from. Um, Africanus was the last guy that we mentioned since Africanus didn't write much after he died. Um, all pagan celebrations on December 25th mentioned later in history do not predate Christmas. So Sol Invictus, again, was a mid-fourth century winter feast Africanus is, um, he died in the early third century. And Mithras itself, there were no public ceremonies of Mithras. It was a mystery religion. And so Mi Roman Mithraism uh, postdates Christianity anyway. And so, you, so you have that whole thing. Another thing that, that distracts us a lot of times that people pick on us about is the whole Christmas tree thing. Christmas trees are Christian, but they're not biblical, including Jeremiah 10. Have you ever had somebody take you to Jeremiah 10? where it talks about going out and cutting down a tree and then you trim it with gold and silver and you set it up and, and that kind of stuff. And people have said, that's a Christmas tree. It is not a Christmas tree. That is a pagan idol is, is what's being spoken about in Jeremiah 10. They didn't have Christmas trees back then. So um, I've talked about this a lot, but Christmas trees come from Christian plays that they did in the Middle Ages. In the Middle Ages, they would, um, in the middle of the winter, they would get together and have these plays that were called paradise plays. And in paradise plays, they would reenact uh, the fall of man. And so you have Adam and Eve, and you have the tree of life, and you have the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and all that stuff. This, by the way, is where the apple came from. You know how we always think it was an apple that Eve ate? It's not, that's not in the Bible. And the Jews didn't believe it was an apple either. They believed that it was a pomegranate. That's what I believe. I think it was a pomegranate. Because, you know, you want to eat a pomegranate, you don't just bite into it. 
you got to work at eating a, you know, eating a pomegranate. And I think that's what the Lord did with that fruit. It had to be something. It wasn't a banana that you could just get too easily or an apple that you could just bite into or a plum or something like that. It was something that you had to work at to sin against God. And so um, the Jews believed it was a pomegranate. The reason it was, um, it was, the tradition was that it was apples is because in Germany, which, uh, you know, it's uh, in middle Europe where Christmas trees came from, in that area, um, in the middle of the year, right now, there's snow on the ground in Germany. And the last fruit that you would pick before it was winter would be what? Yeah, it's apples. It's just like in our state. It's apples. That's the last fruit that you go out and pick. And so apples were, were still somewhat fresh by the time that you got to Christmas. It's the only fruit that you could stick on the tree as the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil. And so they took, and then, and then when you're looking for a tree, you can't use a dead one. And so you're in the middle of the winter doing this play, so what kind of tree are you going to get? Yeah, what they do is go, get, go out and get an evergreen tree, get a fir tree, and then they, they tack apples on the thing. And that, then, they, then they would do their play um, talking about the fall of man. And that's where Christmas trees came from. And uh, uh, again, you know that, uh, that they came from Germany and that kind of stuff. And it became a symbol of Jesus, basically. And so, um, you know, generally there's always a star on the top of a tree or there's an angel on the top of a tree. And it has to do with the star of Bethlehem or the angels announcing the birth of Christ. And then you have lights on the tree. They used to do use candles of all things. They take candles and put them on a fir tree in your house. Yeah, that's crazy stuff. I wonder how many houses burned down. But then you had you, then, then you had that whole thing. Okay, so the next one, I'm looking. Okay, I'm going to be careful. Because <laughs> okay, yes, I will be careful. Okay, so then you have Saint Nicholas, and Saint Nicholas. Um, you guys know who he is, and he was actually you know, the reason he's called a saint is because. Um, he was considered to be a, a godly man. And he was Nicol, uh, Nicholas of Myra. Um, he was the pastor of a church in um, what we would call Turkey, in ancient a Asia Minor. He also attended the Council of Nicaea. We have his name on documents um, that, that are from the Council of Nicaea. And so that's a really famous uh, church council. And so this guy was a, a godly guy. Where the whole thing came from with Nicholas and presence is he was known uh, as being somebody who took care of the poor. And there is one uh, particular story where a man had three daughters and these three, um, he was poor. And um, it, was a, it was a custom in that culture that um, when you got married that you had to give a dowry. Uh, a woman had to give a dowry. And so, so basically when a guy married a woman, he was getting money at the same time that he married her, which is, I think that's a great idea, you know, about, you know, 30, how many years, 33 years ago, that would have been a great idea. She should have given me money to marry her. I think that's how it should go. Don't you think, guys? Amen. Yeah, absolutely, man. But these, these girls didn't have the money, and so they couldn't get married. And so the story goes, <laughs> that Nicholas, on the day before they were to come of age, uh, took a bag full of gold, and um, enough for a dowry, and he threw it in the window of the house in the middle of the night. And so for the first child. And so they wake up the next morning, and she's got money for a dowry, and she can get married. And um, if you didn't get married at that time, if you didn't have a dowry, it was uh, a pretty scandalous thing. And so um, he was taking care of them. And then the second child, the second girl grows up and she comes of age the next year. And so he comes and he does exactly the same thing because their circumstances haven't changed. And so he throws the money into the house again. And they wake up the next morning, there's the money. Well, at this point, the dad's starting to think, okay, who's doing this? And so the next year, the girls were a year apart, the next year is coming the day that she's going to come of age. And so he waits up at night and he catches Nicholas throwing the money in the window. And that's where that whole story got started, where St. Nicholas comes and gives you money or gives you, gives you um, gifts. And again, he was, a, he was a very godly man, loved the Lord and uh, served the Lord faithfully. Whenever, whenever I think of uh, St. Nicholas, um, this is what I think of. This is one of my favorite things right here. That's who St. Nicholas is. 
He's, he's a guy who bows the knee to Jesus. And actually, the guy's still alive, right? And he's standing before the Lord, right? And that's what he's doing right now. And so that's a, that's a pretty cool thing. And so there, we have covered uh, Horus, and we've covered Saturnalia, and we've covered December 25th, and we've covered all this stuff. Um, here's one for you. Mistletoe is pagan. So there, if you want something pagan, go after mistletoe, okay? <laughs> and with that, let's, uh, let's, let's just get into the rest of the text here real quick, and then we'll get to communion. Um, you know, it says, Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem. Um, let's Actually, let's do a better picture up there. Let's do this one, yeah. Okay, wise men came from the east uh, to Jerusalem saying, where is he who's been born king of the Jews? For we've seen a star in the east and have come to worship him. And when Herod the king heard this, he was troubled and all Jerusalem with him. And when he gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. So they said to him in Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet. And then they, then they quote the passage. Um, one of the things that, that has always been really telling uh, to me about this passage is how many people miss the, the birth of Jesus in this story. And so you have Herod missing the birth of Jesus. And it's not that he's missing it because he gets questioned about it, but he's not interested in it because what it's going to do is threaten his kingdom. When these guys come into town, they say, where is he who's been born king of the Jews? You know what the title for Herod was? Yeah, king of the Jews. The Romans had given it to him. And he, he guarded it jealously. In fact, he killed his wife, he killed her daughter, he killed his son. Right before he died, he killed his son because he felt that all of those people were trying to get at his throne and, and trying to depose him. And when he died, when he, was, when he knew that he was going to die, one of the things that he did was he gave a commandment to his generals that they would go out and they would collect all the rulers in Israel, all the Jewish leaders in Israel, and bring them to a uh, place that he told them to bring them. It was called a, a hippodrome. It's where they had horse races. And he brought all these Jewish leaders there, and he had them imprisoned until after his death. And he said that after his death... On the, day that, on the day that they were going to celebrate um, uh, his funeral, that these guys were to be put to death. And the reason that he wanted to do that is because he knew that nobody was going to mourn him. And he wanted all the people of Israel to be in mourning on the day that they were doing his funeral. This guy was a bloodthirsty man. And um, he was somebody who was after his kingdom, after his power. He built big. When you go to Jerusalem today, when you go to any, any place in in uh, Israel today, you can always tell where Herod was doing the building because he used what were called Herodian stones. They're just huge. There's one of them that's 40 feet long, four feet tall, six feet wide in just a retaining wall in the Temple Mount. Just huge. 40 feet long is, is from there to um, about five feet short, uh, maybe 10 feet short of this side right here. That's how, how big the stones were. Four feet tall is like this. And then um, you have that whole thing. And it had to do with his pride. And so he was somebody who had his kingdom. And because he had his kingdom and wanted to keep it, he missed the whole thing. Um, you have the priests that are there. And the priests have the information. And it, it's always wild to me when I look at this story that when they're asked where Jesus is going to be born, boom, they have the answer. Bible answer, man. Here it is in Bethlehem of Judea, and then they give the they give the passage, and then they even talk about the fact that he's going to be the ruler of the people of Israel and the shepherd of the people of Israel, and uh, they put that whole thing together. But they don't go five miles to look at it, to to find to find Jesus. They they don't they don't care enough about the things of God to actually do anything about it. And again, you know, you can be highly religious. You can be somebody who knows who the Lord is, knows, knows what the Bible has to say, and you can be somebody who totally misses um, everything that has to do with Jesus and, and specifically Christmas and the things of God because you're so much into your religion that you don't care about the Lord anymore. It's wild to me how people can um, have a relationship with God at one point in their life and then replace God with religion. And so church becomes God to them. Uh, the Bible becomes God to them. Worship becomes God to them. Um, 
uh, serving becomes God to them. Ministry becomes God to them, and God puts, gets put in the background. That's where these guys were at. It's something that we have to watch out for. So there are times when your kingdom can get in the way of, of uh, seeing Jesus. There are times when your religion can get in the way of seeing Jesus. The Bible talks about having a form of godliness but denying its power. Then you have Jerusalem. It says all Jerusalem is troubled here. And the reason that Jew, in verse 3 that Jerusalem is troubled is because when Herod is troubled, everybody else needs to be troubled because somebody's going to die. And so they're troubled because of the people who are around them. Um, follow the leader. And so these guys are int intimidated by Herod. They were intimidated, in, intimidated by the priests. Um, they were intimidated, intimidated by the Pharisees and by the Sadducees. Um, you had the, the general populace of Israel was intimidated by all these people. And so they never met up with Jesus. It's one of the reasons that Israel ended up going into, um, uh, actually be, the temple ended up being destroyed and Israel ended up going into captivity. Um, they, uh, I don't know if you knew this, but over a million Israelis went into slavery at the destruction of Jerusalem. And the reason that that happened is because the nation as a whole did not receive Jesus. And the reason is because of peer pressure. It was because of peer pressure. The leaders, the religious leaders, the governmental leaders, the Roman leaders, they were all against Jesus. And so you could see that the population would have that problem too. There were only two groups that got it. And the only two groups that got it in this whole thing are the shepherds <coughs> in Luke chapter 2. And they're despised. They're, they're people that, that um, actually, um, the lowest that you could be in Israeli society was a leper. You know what the next lowest was? Yeah, a shepherd. And God always goes after the lowest. He, goes, he always goes after the despised. And the people who were despised, and um, frankly, the people who could not live up to the rules that the priests came up with, were people that God revealed his son to at the very first. And then the other group of people that you have that God revealed his son to were the Magi. And these are, these are guys who are truth seekers. They're wise men. It says, verse 9, When they heard the king, they departed, and behold, the star which they had seen in the east went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. And when they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceedingly great joy. And when they had come into the house, um, see that they're in a house now? They're not in a stable. They saw the young child, and that word for young child is toddler, with Mary his mother and fell down and worshipped him. And when they'd opened their treasures, they presented gifts to him, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And then being divinely warned in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed for their own country another way. And what you see with these guys is that they wanted to come and they wanted to, to find the Lord. And, you know, the Bible talks about the fact that if we will seek God with, our, with a pure heart, we, if we will seek God with all our heart, that he will be found by us. And that's exactly what these guys were doing. He, God didn't care where they were coming from. He didn't care that they were star worshipers. He didn't care that they were astrologers. He didn't care that they were, you know, um, basically, basically court magicians. You know, you know the whole um, magician thing with the, with the like dunce cap type thing? You know that whole thing? That's literally the hats that these guys wore. That's where those hats come from. It comes from the Magi. And so um, these, these guys are full-blown ma magicians and that kind of stuff. And what God does is he reaches them where they're at because he, he wants everyone. And literally, these guys are outside of the nation of Israel, outside of the Roman Empire, even, at this point. And God reaches out to them with what they know. These guys are into stars, and so what, what does God use? Yeah, he uses a star, because um, he wants to reach the guys who are going after stars. Herod, in verse 8, says, Bring back word to me that I may come and worship him also. They'd made it clear to Herod what they were, what they were there for. And what they were there for was to worship. Um, they, they didn't know a whole lot about the Jewish Messiah. They knew that he was coming. They knew that there were going to be signs and portents of that coming. They knew that they'd seen them. And they came to the place where they thought everybody else would know too. And the only group of people who knew were the religious leaders and they just, just weren't interested. But the reason that they were coming was because they wanted to worship. And one of the ways that they were going to worship is by giving. 
And so they, they come to Jesus, and this is where you get the whole tradition of, th of three magi, because there are three gifts. Gold, which represents um, God, godhood, basically. It represents um, uh, kingship, and uh, in ancient times, kingship and godhood um, was conflated. They were put together. And so the Roman Empire, the Roman emperors <clears throat> um, were called gods after they died at the time that this was written. Um, they started proclaiming themselves to be gods before they died, not too long after the New Testament was written. And you have the same thing with uh, Nebuchadnezzar. Um, you have the same thing with the pharaohs. You have the same thing with all the ancient kings. These guys thought they had egos that were huge, and they, con they considered kingship to be the same thing as deity. This is the only time that that was actually true with Jesus. Kingship and deity go hand in hand. And then you have frankincense. Frankincense is because Jesus was going to be our great high priest. And then finally you have myrrh. And myrrh was, uh, um, it was a um, spice that was used for a number of things. It was used as a perfume. Um, it was used as an antiseptic. I was just talking to Dave earlier about that. And it was also used as an embalming element. And the reason that you have that there is because of the fact that Jesus came to die. And so even in the story about his um, presentation um, at his birth, when Jesus is in a cradle, the shadow of the cross is laying across that whole thing. And you, so you have in those gifts um, every aspect of the ministry of Christ. The fact that he's God come down to earth, in Emmanuel, God with us, the fact that he's our great high priest and the fact that he was going to be our sacrifice, that he was going to come and die for us. That's why Jesus was revealed to the shepherds first because they were temple shepherds. They were the ones who kept the sheep that were sacrifices in the temple and Jesus is a sacrifice lamb. So everything about the Christmas story points forward to what Jesus was, uh, actually who Jesus was at the time and what Jesus was going to be doing. And uh, that's, a, that's a good lead into communion, isn't it? So let's, uh, let's take communion. Um, we'll worship and uh, we'll do it like we always do on Wednesday nights and uh, just spend some time with the Lord. Let's pray. I know I'm a little late, so we'll get you out of here quick. Jesus, we thank you for um, the time that we get to spend in worship. God, we thank you uh, for the fact that you would come down. Uh, for the fact that you would you would come to live the life that you lived and die the death that you died so that we could have the heaven that we get to have. Um, Lord, we thank you for the, the fact that the sacrifice that you made for us wasn't just a legal one, and it wasn't just something that you did to uh, make sure that you got all of humanity or, or um, anything as, um, I don't know, as cold as that. But the Bible says that you died for me and that you died for everyone in this room. Um, you gave yourself for us. And the reason that you gave yourself for us is because we were the joy that was set before you. And you went to the cross despising the shame, looking forward to what you would have with us. And Lord Jesus, we just thank you for that kind of heart, for that kind of love. And so as we celebrate communion, Lord, we just pray that you bless the time and our worship, and we want to honor you in this, Lord. And it's especially awesome that it's, that it's Christmas time that we're doing it. And so we just ask that you bless the time now in Jesus' name. Amen.